All right. Good morning. This is Jennifer, and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study. Really glad that you're with me today. Looking forward to digging into Chapter 7 of Hebrews. Grab your Bible study. We are on Day 2, Chapter 7. And if you were here with us yesterday, I introduced this page, showed everybody a reminder that the entire outline for this lesson is on page 153 of your lessons, but today we are, we, we did our read through yesterday. Good job, everybody. And today we're doing an overview of chapter seven. So grab your Bible and let me, let me get over to there so you can see that. We'll pray and we'll begin and uh, let's just do that right now. Grab some water. Hold on. All right, here we go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day before us, the time that we have in your word. Pray that you will give us a heart and a mind that are focused on your word today and open to understanding what you have to show us. We're going to do an overview, and we just want to get the big picture today. Would you help us to do that? And to all this, we ask that you would get the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's do it. So again, we're going to be doing an overview of chapter seven. Before we do that, well, let's go ahead and get into our lesson by writing out our memory verse. This is um, chapter seven, verse 25. And we started by practicing that yesterday. So grab your Bible. Where is my lesson one? There it is. Um, on the bottom of lesson one, you can see right down here, I've written the verse out for you in the English Standard Version, or just use your Bible, of course. Uh, I will go ahead and move over to that screen so you can see it and move my video up off there. It is, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And those of you who've been with us in our study for a while, are probably thinking, where's the rest of it? <laughs> we had a couple of verses, a couple of weeks now, we've had some long verses, but this is a short one. All right, here we go. I'm gonna go ahead and highlight that or get the highlighter thing off of that. Ah, stop. <laughs> there we go. Consequently, here we go. Consequently, and if you're not sure what we're doing right now, those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm literally just writing the verse like you are. Hopefully, grab your pen, grab your paper. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. Through him, comma, don't forget your comma. Since he always lives to make intercession for them since he always lives to make intercession for them. Love it. We're going to dig into that verse later on in our study. Um, quick grammar rule, by the way. Do you know why there's a comma after him? Because it's an actual sentence, a completed thought with a noun, I mean, a subject and a verb, right before um, him, it ends with him. And then the word since is a conjunction, it connects two complete phrases, independent clauses we call them. Um, and he always lives to make intercession for them could be its own sentence. So comma and since function as a period. And so that's why there's a comma and a since. I'm actually going to be teaching a grammar lesson and it, I haven't come up with a catchy title. The concept is basically applied biblical grammar. <laughs> That's not very catchy. I'll work on that. <laughs> but basically, it's using grammar um, to help you understand the Bible better. Um, a lot of us, you know, we go through grade school, maybe high school, maybe even college, and we, we know our grammar a little bit. And we, we maybe our, our focus in our studies was in English. Um, and so when we get into the Bible, we start to realize, wow, if I understood grammar a little better, I'd be able to understand the Bible better. And it's true. But teaching Bible is basically teaching literacy, I've discovered. So if you are, if I can help you be more literate, um, understanding how words work, how grammar works, punctuation, all that good stuff. Um, honestly, it'll help you to understand the Bible better. Cool. 
All right, so that's our um, memory verse for the week. Our passage that we're going to do an overview from today is actually Hebrews 5, 6 through 11, and beginning in chapter 19, uh, uh, verse 19 of chapter 6, we're going to read through to the end of um, chapter 7. Let me go ahead and show you that back at our study so you can see what I'm talking about. So Hebrews chapter 7, overview. Knowing how great Jesus is as your Savior and your great high priest will change literally everything in your life. That is, if you know it and believe it. There's not a soul reading this today that isn't dealing with big problems and big sins. Truly grasping the greatness of Jesus as your Savior and priest means knowing the one who is big enough to deal with big problems and sins. All of this teaching about Melchizedek is designed to help you understand something about Jesus. To strengthen your hope and assurance to help you know that you have a Savior big enough to deal with your problems and a priest who is able to deal with your sins. So there's your introduction for today, and we of course we've prayed, but we're going to move on now to the read and engage part um, because this is an important way to get into the lesson rather than just jump into the lesson and start answering questions. I purposely organized it in such a way um, that I think it'll be better if, if you, uh, it'll strengthen your mind and your understanding of the scripture if you'll follow it along this way. So hopefully you're, you're doing good at that. Of course, those of you who are watching this video are, I'm, already preaching to the choir, but I'm hoping that the people who are reading along at home are actually reading the instructions I give, which are the following. Triple asterisk, I wrote, <laughs> as you read, complete the chart on the next page. Do this before completing questions one through three. So let's take a look at the chart on the next page. The chart here um, will help us to read and engage through Hebrews 5, um, 6, and 7. And, and this will give us a, an overview, make sure we understand where we've come from before we enter into Hebrews. We're going to take two days to do this. We'll take today to finish most of this chart, and then tomorrow we'll finish up the chart, and we'll go back and answer questions one through three, which won't take much time at all. So let's go ahead and click through to the scripture. I think I already had it called up for you, but oh well, I'll make a new screen. We'll get that out of the way and then get you guys over here on this so you can see what I'm looking at. All right, um, there we go. Oh, my son is here. Hey. <laughs> okay, this is my son, everybody. Say hi. Oh. <laughs> hi, guys. <laughs> I'm on live on Facebook right now. <laughs> <laughs> you have a question about a fork? Okay. He's running errands for me today. Isn't that nice? <laughs> All right. Um, back to our study. So Hebrews 5, 6 um, through 11. So we're going to read through. And here's the questions that we'll answer. You have it on your chart. Um, first of all, you want to notice on the chart that you have. Actually, you know what? Let me go ahead and just pop over to that so you can we'll get the overview first. All right. So you see the chart is outlined so you can see. And the main people involved. So Melchizedek, Abraham, um, Levi or Levi, as, as pronounced in Hebrew, Levi. Um, or, and we're going to combine that with the order of Aaron and then our Lord Jesus. And as we're looking through each of those, um, you're going to be focusing on the details about who they were and what they did, the significance um, uh, in terms of the application and the connections that you make, and then any questions that you have. So as we're reading through, I want you to do active reading. I want you to read through and really think about that and, and collect the details as you're, as you're reading along. All right, let me go back over to the scripture. I'm going to use my, I'm going to be writing here. So I'm not going to continue to go back and forth to the screen for you, but I'm going to be writing on mine while you, we have the Bible verses called up. And the concept here is we're not going to do a straight read through of all these words. We're going to read and think as we're reading and collect information for this chart here to help us really make sure we understand who Melchizedek was, um, who Abraham was, who Levi was, um, and who our Lord Jesus or Yeshua was. Okay. All right, so beginning with the reading here, as he also says in another place, you are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death 
and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So we have immediately information about Melchizedek and Jesus. Let's just drop that on our, our chart here. Really simple. Feel free to read into it from based on your study that you already know about Melchizedek, or feel free to just limit it to what this portion is saying as you collect your information. So I'm going to do it that way. So Melchizedek is a priest, and he's not only a priest, you can write this down, he's a high priest. And Jesus is a high priest also, and we'll write that down in the Jesus box. Um, high priest, and he's after this order of Melchizedek. So just again, really simple, I'm going to hold it up there. I wrote Jesus is a high priest, and I, it doesn't look right. I wrote priest high for Melchizedek. It's hard to speak and talk at the same time. Um, so Jesus is a high priest, and Melchizedek is a high priest. All right. Um, and then anything on significance and application there or questions that you might have, go ahead and write those down. Um, you might have a question about what a high priest is, what they do. You might have a question right now about who Jesus is, who Melchizedek is, depending on what your, your knowledge is from the past. This is, this is kind of why I wanted to do this chart is to, you can see at the very front end of everything, what you feel like you already know and what you want, what you're open to learning in this study. And so um, some of you might have a sense of it, jot it down um, it, in terms of significance and application, and others of you might have questions about it. And of course, then there might be a mix of both. Um, so a question that might come up about Melchizedek is, why is he significant? Um, a question that might come up with Jesus is, and we covered this in a previous lesson, but if you're just now joining us, this would be a legitimate question. It says, whoops, it says, being made perfect, he be I mean, no, 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 verse eight. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. So that might be a question you have. He learned obedience. Jesus had to learn stuff. And so we actually covered this when we went through the study in chapter five. But if you weren't there with us, then this would be a natural question to ask at this point. And you can write the question down and see if you can get an answer through the study. And if you can, this is a great reason why we're in community. You can email me, text me, comment later, or you can go back to chapter five study and answer that question on your own by doing the study and, and learning about what was this about Jesus having to learn something? Um, because a lot of people struggle with that because of, um, Jesus being God, why would he have to learn something? Okay. <clears throat> Continuing on, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Beautiful. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God most high, I'm going to write that down, priest of God most high, um, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to Abraham, that's a good point. So he met Abraham, I'm going to write that down, met Abraham. These guys met each other. Um, <clears throat> da -da -da -da, slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Oh, met him and blessed him. Met and blessed. I'm going to write that down. And to Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. He gave him a tenth. He gave him a tenth. Write that down. He is first by translation of his name, King of Righteousness. So his name is translated, and when you translate it, it means king of righteousness. He is first, first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. So we like someone introducing you saying, you know, my name is uh, David, or my name is Jonathan, and then saying that means, Jonathan means um, chosen of God. And so you can, like my son walking in just now, Jonathan David, beloved gift of God is what that means. And he is. So he gave a tenth, um, and his name means king of uh, righteousness, and then he's also king of Salem, king of peace. Write that down, king of righteousness and king of peace. And if you're like me, you're already running out of space. <laughs> Write small. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave him a tenth of the spoil. So Abraham tithe, Abraham tithe to him. Write that down. And it's beyond dispute. Oh, no, I skipped. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers. So over on um, 
Levi or Levi, I, I interchange it so much because I, the Hebrew is Levi. You pronounce it Levi. Anyway, um, da, 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 the sentence of Levi who receive a priestly office. So Levi is the priest's office. That's the order of Aaron, by the way. We, I wanted to point that out because Melchizedek is an order um, and everyone stems from the people who follow after him. And then Levi, there is an order of from Aaron. But this man who does not have his descent from the received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in other case, by one of whom it testifies that he lives. One might say even that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, where he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. So Levi hadn't been born, of course, because we know the genealogy. If you remember from a previous study, we have Abraham, who gives birth to Isaac, gives birth to Jacob, or his wife does, of course. Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. And Jacob has 12 sons, and among those 12 sons is Levi. And we'll learn more about those later, but Levi and Judah are the two important sons that come from um, the father of Jacob and great-grandfather um, Abraham. For when there was a change of a priest, no. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, um, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there be, or would there have been, for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? And we talked about that order of Melchizedek, order of Aaron, Levi is the order of Aaron. Jesus is said is coming as the, under the order of Melchizedek. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. So now we have our first um, our Lord information that you can write down. So our Lord Jesus is descended from who? Judah. This becomes more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of his weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. So Jesus introduced a better hope. Write that down. I love that better hope mentioned there. Just a beautiful concept. And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. So pause there and understand that the tribe of Levi, the Levitical priesthood descended from Aaron, the order of Aaron, formerly became priest without an oath. Write that down. Became priest without oath. But this one, Jesus, was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. All right. So Jesus became a priest with no oath. Now we're going to really get into this. So if you're like, I didn't know that. I don't understand that. It's okay. <laughs> Just jot down some thoughts. You don't have to jot down what I'm saying, but jot down some thoughts of that. Jesus makes, um, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. So under um, details, um, Jesus is better guarantor of a better covenant, or the guarantor, sorry, of a better covenant. And over where it says significance, application, connections, for me, I just think about that immediately, that I'm so thankful that I have Jesus, um, that we are under the priesthood of Jesus, and we, we have this better covenant, a better hope. So I'm going to write that over there under significance, better hope, better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. Write that down under the um, Levi, prevented by death. So they died off. 
obviously you're not going to live forever. You're just a regular human mortal man. The Bible reminds us of prevented by death. So they always had to find new ones, it says, but he holds the priesthood permanently. Write that down about Jesus. Permanent. Why? Well, that makes sense. Why? Because Jesus conquered death. He holds a priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Here's that draw near. We've heard that before. For it is indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. His sacrifice was once, write that down, and for all. So his sacrifice was once, one time, for everyone, for all. And now contrast that with the priesthood of the, the uh, Levi, the Levitical priesthood, um, total opposite of that. It wasn't once and for all. It was over and over and over and over and over again, and it was only for the Jews. Okay? So Jesus is once and for everyone. The Levitical priesthood was over and over again and only for the Jews. Okay? He has no need like those high priests to offer. Oh, I just read that. Um, for the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law, appoints a son who's been made perfect forever. The law appointed men in their weakness as high priest, the Mosaic law. But the word of the oath, God's word, we talked about this in chapter 6, which came later than the law, appoints a son, Jesus, who's been made perfect forever. All right. So maybe you have some questions about this. Well, hair tickling me. <laughs> Maybe you have some questions about this passage. This would be a good time for you to pause the recording and go back and look through and ask yourself questions. We're going to engage more with this tomorrow. But for now, we're going to, we're going to pause here and come back to this tomorrow since um, this I scheduled this lesson to take two full days. So I want you to have time to engage with it on your own and ask some questions. So go ahead and, and pause the, the, the podcast video and, um, and or just finish up into the end. I'm going to pray in just a minute. Um, and then go back and make sure you answer your questions. Tomorrow, we're going to go back and kind of overview this chart real quickly, but we're going to answer questions one, two, and three together in tomorrow's study. That's it. All right. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. Don't forget to check in. I love it when you click the like and the, and the hearts and all that, but I really appreciate it when you check in, leave a comment about what you learned in the study. It lets me know that you're actually engaged. I know how it is on Facebook. People see something that pops up from somebody they know and they click like, it's almost like a automatic thing to do. But if you've actually participated in the study, why not leave a comment and feedback um, about what you're learning, what you appreciated, um, uh, an aha moment you had, a question that you had, and that let's engage Hello, Lucy. Make a noise over there. Uh, let's engage with that together. If you're on YouTube, it's easy enough to click the like button for this video. That actually really helps us, by the way, for other people to find the video. The more likes we get on a video, the more it pushes it forward uh, so other people see it. And then the same thing goes for the podcast. The more that you comment on podcasts and engage with those, the easier it is for people to search and find um, this material and join us in this. All right. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. I look forward to being with you tomorrow. Until then, you are loved and prayed for. Bye-bye for now.